Amen. How are we, church? What is up? Man, we take a week off and like everybody decides to come to church then. It's, it's a full place. It's happening here. It's good to see you all. Way better than church at home. Am I right? Yeah. Um, if you're just jumping in with us, we part of what we're excited about is that we have been going through this uh, up, update process. We've been doing some remodeling in the room, and so that's kind of why we're drawing some attention to things. John was just whispering to me as these slides were going. I mean, uh, the staff especially, I think we had to live with it more than anybody. And so as we watch these slides go by, John's like, it's like I was once blind, and now I see. You know, and it's like, <laughs> I'm like that is so true. It just looks so good. Uh, how many of y'all like had a hard time reading before, and now you can read? Yes. Yes. And if you can't, you really do need to go get your eyes checked, okay? Because it's, it's better. Um, so we, we've been doing all these updates, and I did want to just kind of give you guys a little bit of a status update as to what's going on. Um, all, the thing that they're waiting on now at this point is to replace all these light fixtures that you see out here. These are the original light fixtures that were in this room, and we've purchased them all. Uh, with the supply chains the way that they are, it did take them a little extra time to come in. So there was a few factors complicating things, and I'll kind of break it down like this. Uh, they took longer to get here because everything's on a boat somewhere, right? And uh, the other thing that complicated it was that our current electrical infrastructure is not awesome. Uh, so it's 40 years of different guys who are handy and who can tie things into an electrical line here, and they pull power from here to take it over there. And praise God for Tim Wadham, who is our facilities guy, who is who's literally labeled, yeah, you can clap for him. He's labeled every outlet and, and switch as to what sub-panel it is on in this building. And it's, it's not, there have been several times, and I, like this is a true story, our electrician who's been on site for, for several weeks now, uh, he's, he's just laughed. At, you know, spontaneously every now and then where he's just like, what is happening here? He told me the other day, he, he actually dis, he disabled a wire that should be powering all the lights out here and they were still on. How cool is that? That's amazing, right? So there is, there is a, uh, there is just, there's no existing like blueprints or schematics for how the wiring is done out here. And so all that's getting cleaned up over the next couple weeks. And these lights that we got, uh, they are just a little bit complex. And so installing them has not been easy, but we will have hopefully all these lights swapped out in the next couple of weeks uh, with some fine tuned stuff that you're going to see over, over and, um, just around the room. But um, we do have everything all wired now also electrically for AC to be installed in the early spring. Um, so that'll be here for us next summer. So everything is progressing well. And really, uh, it's progressing pretty close to on budget. We're a little over budget in some areas, but it, you just should know that as a lot of you have invested in this project, that it is staying the course on budget. We're going to be able to do everything that we intended to do, which is amazing. Uh, and a few other things as we're going. So um, once again, I just want to say, I, Katie and I, uh, took a, a weekend, a couple weekends ago, and we got out of town um, like we've tried to do every year. And we've just spent some time praying for uh, some direction for this church because we, we know in our hearts, this is, not, this is not my church. This is not the staff's church. This is not our church. Uh, this is the Lord's church. Amen. And so what we want to do is we want to set aside some time coming into the new year going like, okay, God, what what do you want from this church? And so as we were doing that, I just wanted to say and lay before you all um, that I, I am just struck constantly with gratitude for this church family here. Um, you guys are just a, a, a wonderful people to be in church with. Like it's not just a church that we pastor, it's a church that we are immersed into as a family. And that just brings me so much gladness uh, in my heart all the time consistently. And I wanted you to know that. And just, I think all of the stuff that we're doing around here, it all just wraps into this idea of family, doesn't it? That, man, we're just investing in our house where we spend time worshiping, and I'm grateful for every single one of you for sure. Um, enough of that, I guess, but we'll jump into the Exodus. See, I'm about to get all emotional up here, you know, but um, we're jumping into our Exodus series as we've been going through now for the last several weeks. And uh, we, we had to really, it's sad to kind of have the Bread of Life sermon be the one that's the church at home because it's just such a pertinent message, I think, for everybody that God does not just want a weekend relationship with you, but he wants a relationship with you where you are engaged with him daily. Jesus did not come just to be a good teacher. He came to be the bread of life, to be the thing, the person that is actually physically sustaining you every day of your life. And so if you missed that message, jump on YouTube, go back on the website and catch that message. But for this week, uh, where we've gone in the story thus far is Israel. Uh, we've learned the backstory to Israel. We've watched them be dramatically rescued out of Egypt, right? We saw the plagues happen. We saw them cross the Red Sea. We saw them now wandering through the wilderness and starting to whine, starting to complain. I thought that was the part of that God my heart most last week in the message was they were in one moment worshiping the Lord because they just crossed the Red Sea. And then three days later, they were grumbling and complaining. 
And man, if that's, if that's not you and me, then you just need to be more honest in church this morning. Because by Wednesday, some of y'all are complaining about the job that God has you at. You're complaining about your boss. You're complaining about your family. And it's just, it's our pattern. It's what we step into. And now where we're going to get to in the story is the moment where God has brought Israel to the foot of Mount Sinai. And this, if we kind of take a step back and look at the big narratives or the big scenes that are moving throughout Exodus, we see now where Israel is going to step into covenant with God covenant. I think the most practical way that we have to interact with that word covenant is is a covenant marriage. Two people coming together in covenant union, committing themselves until death do us part. Amen? Like it's this idea that, man, no, I'm I'm choosing you and I'm going to be with you and I'm not going anywhere. And this is the moment where Israel gets that with the Lord. And so we see this in Exodus 19, starting in verse 1. It says, on the third new moon, after the people of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on that day, they came into the wilderness of Sinai. They set out from, how would you say that word? Rephidim. That's how the guy on the Bible app pronounced it. I, I didn't know how to pronounce it. So I just was like, yeah, sounds good. They set out from Rephidim and came into the wilderness of Sinai. And they encamped in the wilderness. There Israel encamped before the mountain while Moses went up to God. The Lord called to him out of the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the people of Israel, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Anyone else, when you read that, you just get some like Lord of the Rings vibes? You know what I mean? When the big eagles just come, and you're just like, where were they the whole movie? You know what I mean? You ask that question to yourself? Okay. There's just this dramatic rescue that happens, right? And, and God brings them out. He says, Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all people for all the earth is mine and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. I want to kind of start this by, by saying God's rules, God's laws, God's ways are the path to life. And so here's what, what kind of happens that's frustrating to me in culture that we live in now today is that somehow Christians are labeled as, as a, a lesser version of living than other people. Do you feel this? Where we get labeled as, as prude, we don't know how to enjoy relationships and sex like other people. We get labeled as stingy, as people that aren't generous. We get labeled as people that don't know how to party and how to have fun right? Do you feel this? That, that somehow when you take on the label as Christian, what you're owning is this label from culture that you're living a lesser version of life. And yet Jesus's words in John 10, 10 is that he has come so that he might offer us life to the full. So the Bible's telling one story about where we can get this life and culture's telling us another. Culture's telling us that Christianity and religion and rules and laws are trying to stifle life from us while Christianity is saying, that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, that nobody comes in this abundant life apart from him. And and as we go through this today, we're going to walk through the 10 commandments, but I just want to lay before you my, my, I guess my thesis statement is that God's rules, it's Psalm 1611, you have made known to me the path of life. You have made known to me the path of life. It is God's word that is the path of life. And so you can, here's kind of the two-part way that you can interpret that. You can, you can reject it and ignore it, and you can act like you can find life outside of God on your own, and you can reject his rules, and you can reject his uh, commandments, and you can kind of live your own way, and it's only going to cause separation between you and God and the destruction of yourself. Amen. Some of you who have been, who've, you've pursued some of those things, and you found the emptiness in them, Right? And then there's another way that you can live where, you, where you're maybe so familiar with the law. And I, I want to kind of pick on maybe some of you who grew up in church, where you're just so in tune with the law and what God wants from you that you're failing to operate in his grace. So there's, there's a two side of this coin as we're going to walk through it today. But first, what I want to do is I want to read to you the Ten Commandments. Uh, before we do that, you know, when I was a kid, I, I, I've told you guys before, I didn't really grow up in a, in a Christian home. We didn't go to church every Sunday, but I did have this sign uh, on my bathroom wall. It was this exact sign, actually. I was like, Mom, do you have that sign still? And she grabbed it for me and brought it. Uh, it's, it's God's 10 rules, God's rules, right? And it, it just has all these, uh, it's all the 10 commandments distilled down into kid version, right? And so I, you know, this would sit right in front of my toilet when, uh, when I was young and this is kind of dating myself here, you know, but we didn't have smartphones, um, you know, when I was in middle school and high school. And so you just kind of sat there, you know, and you just, 
just read. You didn't, you, didn't look at, you didn't look at Reels. You didn't look at Facebook. You didn't catch up on Twitter, anything like that. You just, you just watched what was in front of you. And so I just, I read these rules all the time and I saw them. And, and, and you know what you do when you read these rules? You go, uh-oh. Because I see one of them on here is that you shall show respect to your father and mother. And that's a, that's a problem, right? Because uh, I don't know about you, but I didn't do that perfectly, right? So let's read now. I want to read the Ten Commandments. And if you have your Bible with you, I'd encourage you to open up to Exodus chapter 20 with us. Uh, if you're following along, you can jump on your YouVersion app and you can follow along with the event for today. And it's going to have all these slides in there. But I think it's, we're going to kind of be in and out of these slides. And so I'd appreciate it. I think it'd be helpful for you if you could see them as we go. Exodus chapter 20, starting in verse 1. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Commandment number one, you shall have no other gods before me. Commandment number two, you shall make for yourself, or you shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them for I am the Lord your God. I am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. Commandment number three, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Commandment number four, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant, or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Commandment number five, honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord God, the Lord your God is giving you. Commandment number six, you shall not murder. Number seven, you shall not commit adultery. Number eight, you shall not steal. Number nine, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Or it could read in your Bible, you shall not lie. Commandment number 10, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. Now, when all the people saw the thunder and the flashes of lightning and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, the people were afraid. And they trembled and they stood far off and they said to Moses, you speak to us and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us lest we die. Moses said to the people, do not fear for God has come to test you that the fear of him may be before you that you may not sin. The people stood far off while Moses drew near to the thick darkness where God was. As we read these commandments, um, Jesus' words, we'll look at these later, he's going to say that all of these commandments, there's actually 613 commandments that are given in the giving of the law. These are just the top 10, the first 10. It's what you think of when you think of God's rules, God's law. Um, it's the 10 commandments. It's kind of like the Bill of Rights in our Constitution, even though that uh, analogy is, isn't going to play out perfectly for us. But it is the top 10 things that are not meant to be changed, altered ever. This is what we're given, and this is what the people of Israel are given to say, this is what's going to make you a distinct people amongst all the other nations in the earth. And so God gives them the Ten Commandments. He gives them the moral law for two reasons. The first is to glorify God so that they would look distinct, so that, that everyone would know that this is their God who has brought them out of Egypt, and he is calling them into life in a certain way. The first point of the moral law is to glorify God. And the second is for our good. The second is for our good. So like societies that build themselves around God's law and God's commandment are not blessed in some kind of arbitrary or ethereal way. They're blessed because uh, societies that don't murder and that, don't, uh, that value the family unit, societies that, that know how to rest and know how to honor God as holy, those societies tend to do better. And that makes sense, does it not? Right? Y'all with me this morning? So what we have in the giving of the law is really twofold. We have it, uh, a distinct moral way of living so that, we would, so that we would glorify God in the way that we live and so that we would benefit, so that we would live in a way that benefits one another. Uh, the first four of the commandments are all based around this glorifying God. In the first one, he says, you shall have no other gods before me. 
Now, these first two, you shall have no other gods before me and you shall not make for yourself a carved image because I am a jealous God. I remember listening to this interview one time with Oprah and I don't want to misquote her or misrepresent her in some way, but it was, it was not a good interview. She was kind of making God out to be this jealous God in the way that like a boyfriend gets jealous of a girlfriend in high school. And that's not how God gets jealous. When, we, when God is saying here, when he's making the distinction that you shall have no other gods before him, he, he is the most valuable thing that you could have in your life. And so he recognizes that as you glorify him and as you set him as preeminent, as uppermost in your affections, that's only going to benefit you because he is the most important thing in your life. But when it says that you shall not make yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything, because I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God. What he's saying there is he wants your fidelity. He wants you to belong exclusively to him. And again, why? Because God is not trying to stifle us from life. He's trying to invite us into, usher us into life to the full. And so when he's saying, I don't want you to go anywhere else, he's saying, because I am the source of everlasting life. Just like we sang this morning, God is worthy. God is holy. He is like no other. He alone is meant to be worshiped in our hearts. Amen. Commandment number three, you shall not take the Lord, the name of your Lord, uh, the, the name of the Lord, your God in vain. I think what we think of this as we shouldn't use God's name as like a bad word. And so we change it in Christian. We say things like, oh my gosh, or OMG. But we, we refuse to say like, oh my God, because it, even me just saying that probably just bristled in your hearts a little bit. But what this is actually pointing us to is the fact that you shall not be treating the God's name flippantly. And so I've listened to people say, oh my God, where are you? I need you. And in that moment, they're crying out to him. It's not about just necessarily the specific words you say. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? It's about the posture in your heart towards the name of the Lord. We don't treat it lightly. We, we honor him and we glorify him by the way that we use our tongue when we speak his name. Because James would show us later in the book of James that what comes out of our mouth is really just an overflow of our heart. And so if we're easy, if we're easy to say the name of the Lord uh, really flippantly or cheaply, that indicates that in our heart, there's, an, there's something off in us that doesn't really value and honor the Lord in our hearts. And so, yeah, it matters how we use his name because, because it shows what we, how we really value him in here. So the, the fourth one, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Again, these first four are glorifying God. Um, I, don't, I don't love doing church at home. Uh, for many reasons, but one of the reasons is because I have to watch myself. You know what I mean? Um, and that's uncomfortable. And one of the things I realized that I did last week when I was explaining the Sabbath is I think I, I cheapened how much that day is set apart in his commandments to worship him, to worship him. See, because oftentimes we make the Sabbath more of a self-care kind of day where it's like, well, you work for six days, you got to take one day of rest. And absolutely, I think there's a lot of truth in the rhythms of life that God has established for us. But above all else, the Sabbath day is meant to be a day that is kept holy. It's a day where we prioritize him and we worship him. Many of you, today is your Sabbath. You are taking the first day of your week, Sunday. But isn't it awesome that our calendars are built off of this idea of Sabbathing, where the first day of your week is Sunday. And here you are on a Sunday morning, coming here and giving God worship with the very first part of your week. Did you know that um, Gallup did a study and they did a, they did a poll of people's mental health in 2020? And it's like, man, what a year to do a poll on people's, 20, uh, people's mental health, right? 2020, it was terrible. And they did this, you can look it up online. In uh, November, they published the results of this poll. Um, Every, every category that they surveyed, uh, Republican, Democrat, income level, uh, all these different things, everyone's mental health suffered in 2020. Not surprising. Is that not surprising to anybody else? There was only one category where people's mental health actually improved in 2020. Can you guess what it was? People, listen, it's, it's important that you get it distinctly. People who attended the weekly Sunday gathering people who are at church weekly, their mental health didn't miss a beat uh, last year, according to this Gallup poll. And I find that fascinating. I find that uh, just reflecting the truth that God's commandments are given to us for his glory and for our good. That as we continually engage in the things that he's called us to do, as we Sabbath, as we set apart a day to come together, to study and to worship and to gather as God's people, he's also increasing us our own joy. He's helping us in our own mental health, in processing and, and weathering the things that are happening in this world. So you can kind of take that with you or not, and hopefully you'll be back next week because you'll believe it. 
the next, the next six commandments are all going to be about now um, how, we, how we interact with one another, how we interact with one another. Commandment number five, honor your father and mother that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. Uh, young people in the room, I do this every time we talk about this commandment. Um, your parents have a view of your life that you don't have yet. They just do. And they, and they love you and they care about you. And your call biblically is to honor them is to honor them. That means you show them respect. That means you follow the rules that they establish for their house. And parents, that means that the rules that you establish for your house shouldn't be just these overtly stifling rules, but they should be rules that, that are understandable for your kids. Hey, you can't be out past midnight. Why? That's a stupid rule. Well, listen, I was really stupid when I stayed out after midnight. That's why that's a rule in our house. How many times have you watched the kid who drifts off into rebellion because of all the oppressive rules that were put on their house and it becomes almost impossible for them to honor mom and dad because mom and dad, out of some sort of wound or insecurity on their end, are, are pressing all these rules on kids that they can't follow. The, the irony, and I don't mean any shade to my parents because they're sitting right there, um, but the irony of posting these 10 commandments on my bathroom wall is that without the inward participation of the Holy Spirit, I was never going to be able to follow these things. And this is what we're going to talk about this in just a sec. But the only thing the law brings to those who can't follow the law is guilt and shame. Because as soon as you can't be perfect, you're only aware of your imperfections. And so I bring this up, parents, on purpose to say that, listen, explain your rules with full transparency. Your rules probably exist for a really good reason, but explain them with full transparency. Uh, own some of your own mistakes that you made when you were a kid. Leverage trust when your kids are doing things well. And kids, uh, like, I just got to beg you to consider, you think your mom and dad are idiots right now. If you could be really honest, that's how you feel in your heart. And I'm just telling you, they're smarter than you. Parents said, Amen. They're paying for everything. They have more resources than you right now. They're taking care of you. They love you dearly. And so as you seek to honor them, you have to participate in that honor with a grace-filled participation where you go, I know my mom and dad aren't perfect, but they're trying their best to emulate Jesus to me. And so I'm going to honor them. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be respectful towards them. Number six, uh, you shall not murder. Pretty straightforward. Number seven, you shall not commit adultery also pretty straightforward. But what's a bummer about these two commandments is that Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, he's going to pull back to these commandments and he's going to say, you've heard it said you shall not murder, referencing the 10 commandments. And then he says what? But I say to you, even if you're going to look at one of your brothers in contempt or in anger, you've already committed murder in your heart. Even if you look at somebody else lustfully, you've already committed adultery in your heart. And so this is, the part of the, this is the part where you just go, man, maybe you were perfect keeping the Sabbath. Maybe you don't have any like images or idols that you've carved out on your own and you've made and you're worshiping to. Um, but, but we've all failed in these 10 commandments. We've all failed. You shall not steal, number eight. I remember when I worked at Showtime Video when I was in high school, one of my first jobs, right? Rest in peace, Showtime Video. You will be missed. Um, but I, there was this like, there was this uh, three for a dollar candy section and you know, I would just walk by and I would just grab candy out of there and I'd never pay for it. And, and I, I convinced, you know, the, the thing about that is you kind of convince yourself you're not stealing because you're just like, well, he'll never even notice that, you know, no one, no one buys this stuff anyways. You know what I mean? It's like nasty old candy. Somebody's got to just take care of it, right? But, but the nerve in that moment in, in my heart was that I was owed something that didn't belong to me. Right, and so I mean, you can think about all sorts of things um, in in this world that we're living in today, where they become where they become uh, really really theft, even though we wouldn't label them like that overtly. But it's any time that you're taking something that you think belongs to you, and you've maybe justified in this way it belongs to you. I, I mean, let's just go all the way in there. Uh, when you talk about um, just being covetous, that's the 10th one. But if you talk about being covetous of people's possessions and you just say, well, we should just take that and tax it from them and then redistribute it to everybody else because they deserve it. That I think you have some leg to stand on to go like, I'm not sure that's the way that God has designed this to operate. So there you go. I just probably offended some of you and I'm sorry. Um, number nine, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Uh, bearing a false witness, gossiping, lying, being slanderous with the way that you use your tongue. Again, all of this is going to be brought into a bigger light in the New Testament to show just how bad it is. Because when we bear a false witness against somebody, we're actually participating with the devil in what he's trying to do in somebody's life. But when we actually would be 
honoring and be uh, truthful, when we be honest about things that are happening, uh, even, even the proverb is going to say, better are wounds from a friend than kisses from an enemy. And so when we're actually going to be honest with people and we're not going to bear a false witness, and we're not going to gossip about them, slander about them, we can actually use our words to participate with the Holy Spirit with what he's trying to build up in somebody. So there we have, uh, you shall not lie, you shall not bear false witness. False witness, and then number ten. That's just this is just the uh, you know if there was an American version of the Ten Commandments, number ten just wouldn't exist. You know what I mean? It's like don't covet your neighbor's stuff, and like oh, I'm sorry, but like our, I I love capitalism. I, I think like our economy is awesome uh, in in so many ways, but I just think that like we are our DNA as Americans is built upon you don't have this, and you'd be happier if you if you had it. Every, like every commercial, everything that you see, the algorithm on all of your social media accounts is all trying to tell you that, man, your life is really not actually that awesome. And it would be awesome if you just had this thing, which when you really distill that down, it's coveting. It's wanting something that doesn't belong to you. And this is the 10th commandment where if you, if you got through the list pretty unscathed up until here, uh, this one just got you because this is in all of our hearts. All of our hearts, when you get jealous about this person that just got that promotion, when you start longing for this thing that you don't have and, and you really don't need, but you just want it so bad, and, and all of us at different times are covetous, for sure. And so what's the big problem with the Ten Commandments? Like, if we could, if we could live this out, can't you guys agree that society itself would be a whole lot better? Let like just think, if, if we if, even just take this church right here, if we were just, if we were a community and we were a town, and if we just could frame everything on these Ten Commandments and we could live it all out, wouldn't, wouldn't that be a pretty awesome place to live? Like God would be glorified. God would be at the center of everything that we did. And we would treat one another with like a ton more dignity and respect than we currently have going on in our hearts. And so for as much as the church loves to cherry pick other people not following the rules, really I think what the Ten Commandments serves us well to do is to, is to hold it up to yourself and ask yourself, how are you doing following these things? You know, the, 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 the law itself, Paul's going to unpack this in the book of Romans. Uh, the law itself is really just going to show us that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. It's going to be like this spiritual MRI that we get to hold up to ourselves just to see where we've messed up, where we've fallen short. I was thinking about it this way. Uh, the law is kind of like when you go to get your phone out and you go to take a picture of something and then you realize that you're accidentally on selfie mode. <laughs> Do you know that moment that you have when you're actually, and you're like, oh my gosh, and you're like, I can't even find a good angle of myself. Like, never mind, let's just put that away. Do you know what I mean? Younger people, you know what I mean. When you're just like laying in your bed in the morning, first thing, and you're accidentally on selfie mode, and you're like, oh no, right? This is what the law does to us. The law gives you this kind of oh no moment. Um, Romans, Romans 7 shows us what our relationship with the law should look like. And I find so much comfort in the way that Paul unpacks this for us here in Romans chapter 7. He says, so I find it to be a law not the law, not the moral law, not the Ten Commandments that we're talking about. He's kind of saying, I find it to be a rule that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God. How much did you say? I delight in the law of God. Like, man, his word is a lamp unto my feet. Like, I, his, his law is like honey on my lips. So many people in this building right now, you would say, yes, I delight in the law of God, in my inner being. But I see in my members, I see in me another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am. Okay, Apostle Paul, whatever, bro, you know? Wretched man that I am. Who will deliver me from this body of death? He's so dramatic, isn't he? And yet, like, I just, I think we can find so much comfort that this is the man who wrote two thirds of your New Testament. Two thirds of the book that are in your New Testament has this inner battle going on. Can't you take some comfort? Can't you take some solace knowing that we are not going to be perfect until we go to be with Jesus forever? Wretched man that I am, who can deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh, I serve the law of sin. Romans chapter seven is a fascinating chapter of scripture because what Paul shows us is that our relationship to the law uh, has to be put to death. Has to be put to death. In the same way, he uses this marriage analogy. He said, if you're married to somebody, the only way that you can, uh, not be, you can be freed from that covenant of marriage is by death. That makes sense. Um, Ruth, Ruth, um, no, 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 what's Billy Graham? So Ruth Graham was Billy Graham's wife. You know this quote from Ruth Graham? She was like, I never considered divorcing him, but I did consider murdering him. <laughs> I was like, that's good. 
Because that's what she's alluding to this right here. Like if, if, he's, if he dies, you know, then you're free. But as long as he's alive, you are, you are stuck in that. You know what I'm saying? This, but this is the relationship that Paul is drawing for us with the law. That without death, we are still bound to the law. And what the law does is the law is not sinful by no means, Paul would say. By no means is the law sinful. But what the law is, the law is giving sin this chance that already exists in my heart to explode now, to, to just uh, to look, proliferate everywhere because now all of a sudden I see this rule that's like I can't covet. And, 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 and now I just realize how much in my heart I really do covet. Or I see that like, man, you shouldn't murder. And I realize how angry I can get at some people who just are terrible drivers or who just whatever, you know, any category, we can get so angry and you realize, oh my gosh, I fail this law miserably all the time. But what Paul says is you have to put to death that relationship, like that relationship to the law has died with Christ. And so this is what's beautiful is we've looked at Jesus as the Passover lamb. Um, What's happened with the law is we had this debt to sin. And then the law was given and our debt just got gigantic because now we just realized, oh my gosh, look at all these places that I'm actually failing and look at all these places that I can't measure up. And Jesus still pays that debt Jesus pays it down for us. And, and what we get invited into is what Jeremiah has he's prophesied about hundreds of years before Jesus. He says, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days. This is the covenant that I will make with the church of Jesus Christ. Declares the Lord, I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts. So no longer do we turn to these tablets of stone for the law, but we have the law written on our hearts. We know what's good. We know what's right. We know what's wrong. And he says, I will be their God and they will be my people. The alternative that Paul offers us coming out of Romans chapter seven is Romans chapter eight, which we spent a lot of time in at the beginning of the year, where you can, you can either choose kind of to have your allegiance to be to your flesh and answering and responsible to and accountable to your flesh, or you can choose to set your mind and your life according to the spirit of God. So you can actually make this surrendering moment where you go, okay, Spirit of God, I want to be in full submission to you. And in that faith-filled step, even though I'm not going to be perfect once I, once I place myself there, I'm, I'm, I'm going to all of a sudden start having this inward transformation that Jeremiah talks about, where I no longer need to be told all these things that I have to do. I no longer have to just necessarily know all the laws that are in this book, but God has put in, he's put the Holy Spirit in me so that I can follow after him and know right from wrong. Romans, um, I have one more passage that I want to read, but, but first I want to tell maybe just a quick story because I, I think this relationship with the law and with grace, the law and with the Spirit of God uh, can get really hard, especially for those of you that grew up in a Christian home. Some of you, you have this testimony and, and you, went, you just went wild for a little bit and so you understand grace really well. And, and you, you're, it's easy for you to, to interact with and to live out of that grace. But for others of you, man, you just, you just grew up in a Christian home and you just, it's like, when did you become a Christian? You're like, I don't know. I just always was at church. I just always there. And the tendency that you have when you just have been, in, even, even like once you've just been in Christianity, the, in the subculture of Christianity, and you've just lived there for a little while, you start to have these tendencies where you start to operate more towards the law and you start to neglect the fact that Jesus saved you by grace alone through faith alone. And so, this story, I, it was early on when I first started preaching and Kent was really helping me weigh in and he was gently, you know, going like, man, you know, hey, you, you said this and, and that wasn't totally right, you know, and, and uh, fortunately that didn't happen too often. But one of the times that was really helpful for me was I was, I was trying to make a point uh, that God doesn't want you to feel guilty. Um, and, and Kent's like, hey, that's not true. That's not true. God wants you to feel guilty. He just doesn't want you to stay there. But without guilt, you can't really ever experience the gospel. I'll say it this way. If you've never felt guilt, there's no way you can ever experience grace. And so he, I was trying to tease out the difference and I didn't have the language for it yet, but he helped me see that there is a difference between guilt and shame. The law, when you read it, when you read the Sermon on the Mount, when you start to spend time with this book, people are like, man, I spent time with the Bible and it just made me feel bad. I'm like, that's amazing. That's step one. Because th- this book is not for people who are already healthy. It's for people who are sick. That's what Jesus said, right? Jesus didn't come to save the healthy. He came to save the sick, the people that knew they needed him. So you spend time with this book. And, and if you are kind of the legalistic person in the room right now, you've been grown up in Christian culture all your life. You need to spend some time this next week reading Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. You need to spend some time reading the Ten Commandments. 
And what you need to look for, I, I think this is what God has sort of just shown me over the weekend as I've been praying. God, how do we, how do we step in and operate in more grace? Um, I think so many times in church culture, we, uh, we like to talk about our sins of omission, as in things that we omitted, things we didn't do. So you, you get in a small group, right? And you're like, hey, how's your guys' week? And it's like, man, you know, I'm really just struggling, right? And what are they struggling with if it's like a Christian small group? Well, I, you know, I just didn't read my Bible as much as I should have this week. You know, it's, I just feel really bad in my heart, you know, and I, I didn't pray as much as I should have. You know, I only prayed on the way to work, not on the way to work, and then on the way home from work. So, you know, it's just been pretty, pretty tough. This is like, this is every Christian church kid you ever met, right? When they get in there and they're like, what'd you, what'd you do wrong this week? And they're like, man, you know, uh, you know, I just... I just only memorized like three passages of scripture this month. Um, I could have done more, I know, but I, you know, I didn't. And, and rather than spending all of our time focusing on sins of omission, things we didn't do, I think some of us, it would serve us really well to spend time in God's word asking God, God, what are sins that I have committed? Sins of commission. Because when you really start to look at the Bible and what it says, go read the book of Jeremiah. And it's going to come time and time again to not call Israel um, someone who's strayed a little bit or who has made a few mistakes or hasn't prayed enough. No, uh, time and time again, the prophet Jeremiah is going to let Israel know that they have been in, like they, they have broken their covenant of marriage with God. And he uses really, really strong words that they have been adulter adultering themselves over and over and over again. And so when you start to realize, okay, um, God has called me to worship no other gods but him. And, and, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think you really worship any of the Egyptian gods that John talked about a couple weeks ago, right? I'm not really sure that you're struggling in that uh, level, but uh, all of us have some Pharaoh in us in, that asks the question, who is this Lord that I should worship him? And so who's the most likely culprit for you to, to have your worship robbed from God? Who are you going to worship first? Yourself. Everyone's kind of made themselves God in their own eyes at a different time. Everyone has, has uh, taken the Lord's name in vain. We've used his name cheaply. We've used his name lightly. And like, look for those spots where you have been guilty. But here's the point. The point is not that you would stay guilty. The, the point of guilt is to draw you back into the gospel. The fact that like, man, I am so guilty. I am so guilty and God is so good that he has saved me. Look, let's, let's all stand. And I want to read this verse. I want you to stand because supposedly you remember stuff better when you're standing up. And so we'll end with this verse right here. Paul writes, for while we are still weak, while we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. So God didn't die when you were doing things well. He died when you were weak and when you were rebelling against him. That's when he paid his blood to buy you, to pay for your debt. He says, for one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person, one would even dare to die. But God shows his love for us that in, in that, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Christ died for you when you were in the middle of your sin. And so as you spend time this week, kind of replaying the tape and asking yourself, God, where have I fallen short? Where have I committed sin? you be reminded of this verse that God died for you. Jesus died for you while you were still sinners. Christ, uh, since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, hear that word. Like the Bible doesn't mince words with this. When Israel gets afraid of God, God doesn't move to remove that fear. He lets that fear sit. He wants us to understand how awesome and how powerful, how mighty, how majestic he really is. And in that fear, that reverent, awe-filled fear, what he's trying to do is he's trying to keep us out of sin. So he says, while we were still enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Here's what Paul's saying. If God died for you while you were an enemy of his, imagine how much more he's going to love you in life now that you've been raised to new life with him. Can you let that sit in for just a moment before we pray? That God poured out his son, the, the greatest act of love the world has ever seen. God sacrificed his son to save you while you were an enemy of his. And now that that debt's been paid and now that you've been brought into his family, how much more are you going to be able to participate in his resurrection life? Folks, God's word is the path to life. It is. 
And there's two ways that you can respond to that today. You can reject it and you can walk away from it and you can pursue your own path as God yourself. And it's only going to lead to a lot of pain. And the other way that you can live according to this book is you can try and do everything uh, for his approval or you can do everything from his approval. And those two things are worlds apart. Folks, church, I just want you to know God loves you. God poured out his blood for you. And so much more now that you have been reconciled back to him, he is trying to call you into the abundant life that only he can offer. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for this reminder this morning. God, I thank you for all the fun stuff going on in the church. I thank you for all these people sitting in front of me today. And we just ask God that above all else, we would have lives where we are uh, in, in a state of rest, knowing that you love us, God. Would we have lives that are marked by uh, a serious pursuit for holiness and a serious pursuit for loving other people? When Jesus says all of this stuff in the Old Testament, all the law, all the prophets can be summarized like this. You you would love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength, and that we would love our neighbors as ourselves. Help us now as we go out of here, having received this gospel for our own heart, help us carry that good news and that reconciliation out into the world where we live. We love you, Jesus, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. 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 Hey, God bless you, church. We love you. We'll see you next week.